welcome everyone to the Flow podcast, where we discuss market structure with industry leaders. My name is Konstantin Schulga. I'm the CEO and the co-founder of Findry Markets, the leading ECN electronic trading infrastructure provider for institutions. And today we have a special guest, Rob, who is the partner of Dragonfly, one of the leading VCs in the entire crypto space. Rob, really grateful to have you here. Thanks for having me, Konstantin. It's great to be here. Thank you. So let's start with, uh, before we dig into the weeds of the infrastructure and the, and the market structure space, let's start with your background. So you've, uh, you, your background is pretty much uh, TreadFi. You, you've spent a great career with Goldman's. Uh, you've been on the like traditional investment firm. And then basically you've pivoted into the crypto. So can you tell a bit more about how did you make this pivot and what inspired you to do so? Yeah, so uh, I first got interested in Bitcoin, it was like 2012 or 2013. So I've been interested in the space for a long time. I was an analyst at Goldman at the time, and you, you mentioned it. And I was spending most of my time on like fintech strategy for the firm at the time. And, you know, through that, through thinking about payments, through thinking about consumer tech, uh, I came across Bitcoin and the Bitcoin white paper. I was, you know, initially like really skeptical, right? I, I'll be honest, like I didn't really get Bitcoin at that time. Um, you know, payments worked fine for me, yeah, right? Like money Bitcoin, worked yeah. fine for me, right? You know, I grew up in, in the U.S. Um, but, you know, I bought a little Bitcoin, thought it was fun, you know, et cetera. I had, and then I had Bitcoin on, on Mt. Gox. Uh, and Mt. Gox blows up. And it was a really, really small amount. Um, you know, I was, a, I was a young kid at the time. But uh, I got really disillusioned, like, really quickly. I was like, oh, man, this sucks. Like, you know, yeah. there's volatility, like, whatever. Like, I'm, I'm out. Um, so I didn't really think about it for another couple of years. And then I kind of rediscovered crypto uh, when the, a little after the ETH white paper and uh, people were talking about smart contracts. Yeah. Um, and I had never heard the term smart contracts before. You know, obviously this goes back to the 90s. Uh, but, you know, I was like, oh, like this is really interesting. And it really started to think about like the financial technology applications of what smart contracts could do, um, how it would change, you know, my role uh, at Goldman, how it could change Goldman more broadly. And that was something that the, the light bulb like really where he clicked. And so um, I started to spend a little bit more time on it. It was a hobby, uh, but I was involved in some of those early conversations at Goldman. You probably remember into 2016, we um, Bitcoin went up to 19K and uh, there was a lot of like blockchain, not Bitcoin stuff happening in crypto. I mean, Blythe Masters was on the front of a uh, you know, uh, business week, I think, yeah. um, with that. And so the ICO were, was were booming as well at that time. Yeah, and when it just came like right after, a little bit after that, that's right. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, a lot of people at, you know, the big banks are starting to think about this space. Yep. And so we, you know, at, at Goldman, we, we stood up like a, basically like an OTC Bitcoin desk on the FX desk. Um, and so I was involved in some of those other conversations, but it still became like a hobby, something I spent yeah. a lot of time on because it, it didn't, it wasn't clear to me that like, oh, like I could go and tell my mother that I was doing this thing at the time. And unfortunately I didn't have enough conviction uh, in hindsight. Um, so I continued to do traditional finance stuff. So I went into, uh, you know, I, I did traditional uh, kind of consumer tech investing at a place called Heritage Partners. I uh, worked again at an advisory shop doing fintech advisory after that. Um, but it was a big part of like just the yep. stuff I would think about and read about and stuff on the weekends. It wasn't until 2020 when DeFi Summer started to happen. And also I was um, doing a lot of work with some of the big fintech companies on their strategy also um, uh, somewhat in terms of M&A, but also just thinking through like, you know, business uh, expansion type of opportunities was and uh, really early talking to Franklin Templeton about like putting one of their money market funds on chain yeah. and um, in PayPal when they were thinking about MPC wallets for, you know, their own kind of consumer application. And uh, I started to realize like, oh, like DeFi summers, awesome. Like, you know, I'm just like having a bunch of fun, like on the <clears> weekends and just crazy times. And then there's also, uh, you know, like large scale, like, you know, kind of big companies that care about this thing. And I was like, okay, so maybe this is like something I can tell my mother that I'm doing. Um, and I should, you know, I'm spending so much time on it anyways, like I should just go do this full time. And it was through my network that I got the opportunity to help um, stand up crypto at a big traditional hedge fund uh, called Golden Tree. Um, partners there had made a bunch of money in the Algorand ICO uh, and we're like, oh, this is also awesome. And like, maybe we should like stand up like a real business here. Um, and through that, uh, was able to, to have that be my first kind of like full-time crypto job. Did that for, for like a year and a half. Yeah. Um, and I think by the end of my tenure there was right on the tail end of what was the, you know, kind of 21, 22, like mania. And I realized that I was still like explaining the difference between proof of stake and proof of work to some of the internal stakeholders. And that just kind of sucked. Uh, it was not what I wanted to be doing. 
and you know had the opportunity um as he had, had reached out about they you know just raised our current fund and he said we're looking he said like we're looking for somebody with your type of background more traditional underwriting um do you want to come on and, and and do that for us and i said that that sounds great so great great journey and like i think perfect timing yeah that's perfect right timing. nice so if we talk about something that also inspired you throughout your journey um we have uh, like a typical question for our podcast about the books that inspired you. So can you mention a couple of books, one that helps uh, within the business landscape and then um, something that inspires you just on the more of a personal level? Yeah, so I think, I don't think you can learn business through books. So uh, I, I don't know, maybe other people have, have other perspectives on this. But you know, you can read all of the investing books, all of the business books, and at the end of the day, like you have to figure out your style by doing it, right? Yeah. Um, and I so I tend to think that actually the best books to learning about how to operate a business uh, are social science related. They're not actually business related. So, um, for instance, like I think like Sapiens is a really important book. Um, and Sapiens, you know, it's you know somewhat of a history of yeah. you know our species. But it is also just, you know, kind of leaning into the fact that being able to like intelligently organize and to plan and think about and dream for the future is as powerful as a thing uh, that can exist, yeah. right? And that's what's kept us uh, Homo sapiens uh, yes. to coming to, you know, being able to do stupid podcasts on, uh, on, <laughs> on uh, why we're sitting here in Austin. Um, and so I think, you know, in, in my mind, uh, like that learning is also is transportable to business, yep. right? Like you as a CEO or a leader of any sort of company, um, what you have to understand is that storytelling and that inspiring and organizing of your, and, and, and steering the ship of that organization is the most important thing you can do, right? And I think people forget that sometimes. They're very technically savvy. They're very, uh, you know, good at, you know, and any, any type of thing, but they forget that storytelling is at the end of the day, their, their real job. Um, and so that is actually to me, probably one of the best books to think about, you know, just human nature yep. in general and emotional intelligence, I guess, as Correct. well. And yes, and yeah. behavioral economics. <laughs> yeah. A hundred percent. Um, and so I tend to think books like that are, are really important. Um, I also just, I'm going to shout out a book, uh, House of Leaves, which is yeah. a, it's a horror novel. So like, it is not at all, you know, types of yes. books that you, uh, you talked about, but it is one of my favorite books. Nice. Um, yeah. And it's kind of a, it, it, it's, it's a horror novel, but it's also just kind of a satire around like criticism and how deeply and like nitpicky we get about criticism and missing the bigger picture sometimes. Um, so I don't know, if you like horror, check it out. Nice. Yeah, we'll check it out for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so now let's dig into the market structure. And you guys are one of the leading VCs in the space, so you have the privilege of observing what is happening and uh, what are the current trends. So what really is the most innovative uh, approach or just what drives your focus and attention right now within the trading space in particular? Yeah, so I think, you know, post FTX, uh, one of the things that you know we've been really focused on, and I think everybody has, so this is not new, um, but it's just like, how is market structure gonna change, yep. right? And it's pretty clear to me that um, we should not be reinventing TradFi, right? Like we don't need a central clearinghouse in crypto, <laughs> right? Uh, and people will come to me and tell me that we need those things. I'm like, listen, like you're 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 not understanding that this is a new paradigm that we're trying to trying to trying to build and here. By the way, we, we had a podcast with <laughs> Ben Stevens, who is building the CCP in crypto. So it's yeah, nice yeah. to have both <laughs> perspectives uh, within this well, series of podcasts. Well, I, I apologize, Ben, and, and I, I've met him. He's a great <laughs> yeah. guy. Um, but you know, he also that, that thing basically spun out of Nomura, right? Which is so it's not surprising that that's their perspective on the world. Sure. Right. Um, so, but listen, I, I think, so for my, my mind is, okay, well, how do we like, you know, appropriately manage risk, right? So obviously what happened with FTX and, and what um, Sam was trying to do was he was basically trying to collapse the entire market structure, right? Yep. He was everything from uh, settlement and clearing to custody and, and leverage. And market making. And market making <laughs> and, 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 you know, brokerage and, you know, exactly. change and everything, right? Yeah. Um, and it's clear that like that is not, you know, the appropriate way to think about yep. the world. Um, but it's also clear that we don't need a central clearinghouse. And so uh, what we think a lot about is like, well, how do we do, take a little bit of the best of on-chain and off-chain, right? Yep. And so, you know, what's really, really good off-chain? Well, um, 
you know, things like, uh, you know, latency in your order book. A matching right? agent, like, yeah. A matching agent, yeah, yeah. exactly, right. And so like those types of things are, you know, I don't really see that competing on chain, right? Yeah. Um, and especially not for institutional folks, right? A, we can talk about why AMMs are great for a certain part of the market, but, um, yeah. you know, not for the part of the market we're talking about, yeah. right? Um, and, you know, settlement and, 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 cost and, and clearing, um, you know, there are, wor there are worlds in which it makes sense to be on chain and off chain, right? Um, and I think, you know, at the very least, having an immutable ledger that you settle or that you stream data to on chain um, is better than a opaque centralized system, right? Sure. And I think that is something that, so we think a lot about like, how do you bring those things together? Um, I also think like reality being is like, you know, brokerage and custody and, and exchange, like these things need to be broken apart. Um, and there are both uh, centralized and decentralized versions of how to get to, to the right place there. And so I spent a lot of my time thinking about those intersections and how to kind of create a better financial services world. Well, I think we're, we're both in the same boat here yeah. and we were preaching for this proper debundling from day one, which was a tough pitch four years ago. FTX helped us a lot. <laughs> so we'll see, uh, we'll see how the market change within the next few years, but hopefully it will not bring all the bits and pieces from the TreadFi. We'll make only, only the best parts and then try to innovate with the rest. Yeah. Um, so now let's talk a bit more about the Dragonfly. You've uh, raised the like the last the third fund in 2022 when the market was still uh, kind of growing, but already I think uh, was it before the L Luna and the like the Celsius yeah. events or yeah we did so, final close in March. Yes, yeah. yeah so like it was perfect timing. After that, we all experienced like the meltdown. So how do you see the landscape today and how does that affect like the Dragonfly and the VC industry in general? Do you see the markets rebound or or not not yet? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take two parts of that question. Yep. One is Dragonfly and one is yep. the market more broadly. Um, you know, for Dragonfly specifically, uh, I mean, you're right. Like we, we, we definitely timed the market uh, really well. The final close in March of 22. Um, you know, Luna happened in mid-May, yeah. right? So we're kind yeah. of right around, around time right now. Uh, around Austin, uh, I think, like consensus. I was, I, I remember I was at consensus last, uh, like two, two years ago and like the Celsius was not down yet. Oh, right. And I texted uh, a few team members of, of my team that I knew were keeping the funds with, with Celsius. I said like, guys, you need to pull over. <laughs> Good for you. And yeah. yeah, and actually it literally like I've, uh, I, I was texting then I was landing a plane hmm. and I had like a 10 hour flight and then when I landed, the Celsius was already uh, like frozen all the withdrawals. So luckily, my, my team members were awake and they were fine and like <laughs> with all the funds. So yeah, it's happened. Good. Well, I'm uh, glad they were fine. Yeah, so. exactly. And that Celsius bankruptcy, we'll talk about that later. That's been disaster. Yeah, but yeah, back, yeah. back, back yeah. To, to you guys. So like yeah. uh, great timing. Now yeah. then the, <laughs> the whole. So, so great timing for us. Um, we, so we did the final close in March of 22. Uh, we had done first close a few months before that. So we were investing out of the fund or had already switched over to this current fund um, by then. Um, and we've tended to be, and uh, it was at first not on purpose, but then it became very purposeful. Um, we tended to be somewhat counter cyclical. So we did, you know, kind of early stage, um, you know, kind of, you know, mostly like smaller checks when the market was super frothy, right? And the reason for that was that, you know, if you get it wrong when you write a 25 or $30 million check into a later stage business, yep. like that has, you know, just a dramatic effect on the returns of the fund. If you get it wrong, if you write a three or $4 million check in an early stage company, like you're supposed to get most of those wrong, right? Like that's the, the world that, you know, VC lives in, right? And so um, as the world came crashing down in, 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 in May and in June, um, we, you know, took stock and then we started to say, well, you know, now there's a lot of things that we really believe in that are at valuations that we see much more attractive. And we started to do much larger check sizes, much fewer of them into things that we had a lot of conviction about. And we did that kind of through 22, another hiccup at FTX later in that year, uh, and then through 23. And um, what, we found, what we found is that that strategy has worked really well for us. Um, coming into kind of this bull cycle, if you yep. think we're in one, uh, we realized that now we have a lot of ownership in things that we really strongly believed in, most of which have done really, really well. And, um, you know, as the market's gotten frothier again yep. uh, here in March and in April, we've actually dialed it way back. So to your point, and we can talk about the market here, the market's come roaring back and we've actually slowed down. Um, and we've been somewhat countercyclical. And I, I would say we're, we're not, you know, that's strategically the, the way we like to think about it because we, we are valuation sensitive. We are... Yep. Um, 
uh, you know, we are very thoughtful about, you know, what we want to back. We don't chase just like, you know, the hottest new yeah. like, theme or whatever. Um, we're still open for business, of course, and we're still doing checks, but it's just, we've, we've kind of, you know, just by the nature of the way we are as investors, kind of switched that up. The market, to your point, though, like the market was dead a year ago. You know, I would hear from people uh, all the time, like, oh, we, you're the only one we're seeing in, at any of these deals, right? You know, or there's like a couple of us. Everyone else was worried about, you know, oh, am I going to be able to, to raise new LP capital? Or am I going to be able to raise the next fund? Like, should I be, um, you know, at the point right now, do I need to elongate this fund? And we were saying, listen, like, we think the market's going to come back. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about our deployment pace, but we feel we're very, very confident that this is, these types of deals are the ones we should be doing and we should be writing 10, 15, 20, 25, $30 million checks. Um, and, uh, and, and so we were, you know, uh, in many ways, one of the few that were open for business, if, if, if not the only one in this part of the market. Yeah. Um, now the market's just run back, you know, the BTC ETFs, like, you know, there's a lot of new, hot new, uh, uh, you know, kind of verticals that people have. So it's been, um, it's been, a, it's been a really, really interesting time, but you know we're still at, I think Q1 was about 3.1 billion of VC funding, uh, Q1 of 2022, so exactly two years ago, yep. was over 13 billion, 13 and a half billion, right? So we are still nowhere near like the froth of, of, of those years, and I'm not sure that we ever get back there, to be honest. Yeah, so that, that was my <laughs> question that you answered pretty, pretty straightforward. So you don't think we'll be that close, not maybe even like in the valuation terms, but in terms of the, the, the overall size of the funding that is flowing into the space? I think there's a chance that we never get back there. Um, I mean, you, you remember 21, I'm sure, yeah. but the, the froth was just insane, right? Yeah. And it was one of the things that happened, and, and what would ha need to ha happen here for, for this to, to happen again, is that uh, all of the big crossover traditional funds we're looking around and they were saying, everyone is getting so rich and we are, <laughs> why are we like missing out? Right? Yeah. And so you had, you know, these guys, these like KKRs and Apollos and Tigers and Kotus and, and, you know, whoever else, General Linux saying, I'm going to write a hundred, 200, $300 million checks into these businesses, into crypto that are doing really well. You know, Blackstone was in chain analysis, like, you know, all of the big yep. traditional guys. Um, and, you know, this was happening though, not just in crypto, but it was happening in like, you know, venture more broadly, yep. right? As we had, you know, at the tail end of ZERP, but nobody quite understood that yet. And we just had kind of cash going everywhere. We, the uh, equity markets were, you know, completely out of control. About multiples were, had really blown out. And so people were just feeling really high. And they all also thought like they were looking at their, you know, on, on paper returns from their last funds. And they were thinking, man, I'm so rich. So like, <laughs> I, I cannot lose, right? You know, so the SoftBank Vision Fund kind of was happening everywhere where yeah. it was just big checks, didn't care about valuation, whatever. Um, so I think structurally, the investment market or the VC market, and especially the growth market, like those are all changed now. Yeah. And that's not just a crypto specific point, it's a, you know, kind of a, a just a broadly investment manager point. Um, and then in crypto itself, one of the things that was happening was that these guys were, were doing these deals, but they were looking at a business model, and, and I love a lot of these businesses, but they were looking at a business model like Custodian, and they were, uh, you know, slapping on like, uh, basically like, you know, 30 times revenue or 40 times revenue multiples onto these things uh, in a world in which like, you know, if that was a public company, it would probably trade at, you know, 18 times earnings, yeah. right? You know, <clears throat> and uh, people just were underwriting basically market beta instead of like, you know, intrinsic value of these different, these different companies, these different business models. And I think this time around when I talk to these guys, they're thinking about coming back, but it's not going to be the same. They're going to be yeah. a lot more thoughtful about things like that. And if the equity markets are open and, you know, ability to get cash out, IPOs, et cetera. But I guess some of those hot money have shifted into the AI space. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, now we see true. the valuations there and crypto is kind of uh, left behind a little bit, which is good for the industry. I mean, like only the strongest will survive. And that just is a sign of the maturing industry, which is, which is I think, nice for both of us. Yeah. Um, talking about the... Um, current bull cycle, I, and I think we both agree that we are in a uh, bull cycle. Uh, it's, it's, it's obvious that it's been driven by the, mainly the institutional adoption, like with the ETFs and uh, probably with some of the larger organizations starting the uh, uh, like crypto initiatives back in 21, 22, yeah. now like rolling out. So do you see we are already there? So is the institutional adoption there or we're still far away from, from the proper mass institutional adoption? 
I guess it really depends how you think about it and like how you define institutional adoption. Um, so, uh, you know, this isn't like a straight yes or no answer, but what is clear is like there is a lot of investment manager interest in having exposure to the asset class, right? Yep. And so, um, you know, $12 billion, or it's almost $13 billion of net inflows, right, uh, into the BTC ETF. And that's with, um, you know, grayscale bleeding out uh, because, you know, a lot of people were doing this, you know, ARB trade with a, with a discount. Um, and, you know, it was the fastest ETF ever to a billion dollars. Um, I mean, it, I think it's undoubtedly the most successful ETF launch ever. Um, and, you know, I don't think any of us, at least not me, thought that, that was going to be that successful, right? Yep. They're, you know, ETFs are primarily like RIA and like wealth manager products. And so I would have expected that, you know, those things move slow, like, you know, you know, your, your, your grandmother needs a little bit of exposure. Yeah, you like, need to educate the sales force, which actually yes. like it's a huge process. And I was working in the investment bank. So my guess and my prediction was because I was also involved in like building the distribution for uh, the, the ETP, ETF products, that it, it should take a couple of years. You need to like educate the sales force. You need to set the proper kind of KPIs and that, 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 that will, uh, will take time. So the question is here is, is it just... Did it just happen uh, faster and um, we, we, we saw it already? Or the potential is that huge that yeah. if we see that adoption in the like in just the last couple of months, that it means that in the next couple of years, we'll see like 100 times more than that. Yeah, I, so I think there was a lot of pent up demand. So yeah. it was there was people ready. And you know, yeah. you see it in like when you looked at the filings in the quarter, there was you know pension funds, there was um, you know, wealth managers, uh, clearly who had been preparing for this moment. Right. Um, and so that's been, that's been awesome to see. And I'll be interested to see what happens with the ETH ETF. I'm a little bit, I would say, uh, I'm neither bullish nor bearish. I'm, I'm kind of wait and see there. Um, I think not having staking is a, yeah. is a major issue for those, but I think the, the potential is huge, huge right? Um, <laughs> it's, was, it's clear that there is in a, a really, really, um, just, a really, really big focus or a really big appetite to have exposure to this asset class. Now, when we get to, uh, you know, call it, you know, uh, basically institutional adoption otherwise, um, we're actually starting to see a little bit like a, a little bit of, of movement in that, right? So, you know, all of the big asset managers and, you know, Larry Fink's on CNBC talking about the tokenization of everything. Um, but, you know, all the big banks, they've been working on like tokenization efforts for, years and they didn't stop building because of and most of them didn't stop building because of sam or because of luna they still continue to to focus on these things um I, most people don't know this but broadridge does over one and a half trillion a month of on-chain repo yep. um uh Gen just did an intraday uh, tokenized repo i think with with cumberland um so you're seeing you know those types of tokenization efforts really start to, to ramp up and but they, those places move slowly like they need the, they need the appropriate reporting and the backend software and the, the wallet management services and the um, uh, ability to, to be on the right type of chain. You know, right now it's on something like a Hyperledger, it might move to something like a Canton. Yep. But will that ever move to Ethereum mainnet or, you know, an, an L2 that's public and permissionless? Yep. Like, that's where I'm really dubious. And so I don't know how much those two things come together uh, ever in the future, to be honest. Well, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. So you... you, you... You've been professionally in the industry for like the last few years, but you, you mentioned that you've been involved personally for like at least 10 like years. A decade, yeah. Yeah, so far. So what are the main changes in the industry that you've observed over the last decade? Uh, how did you see the industry evolved? What market practices are not there yet? And uh, what are the main kind of observations about the changes? Yeah, um, you know, it's funny. I think I, I was, there's been a, this is kind of an aside, but there was a fight on Twitter a couple days, last couple of days about like you know like celebrity coins um, yeah. on, and I was like this like this feels very much like twenty one and seventeen, and then like literally the same thing has never changed. We're always fighting about whether celebrity grifters are like a good thing or bad thing for the industry, and you know whatever. Um, but so I think in a lot of ways like the industry hasn't changed, um, but obviously like in most of the ways that matter it has, right? And and the there's just there's better infrastructure, there's better. Um, just education of the institutions about how what the technology can do, how how it can um, it, you know lead to uh, not just like back office costs, but like better execution, better transparency. Why immutable trustless systems matter, yep. right? And we're starting to see um, really interesting types of you know hybrid on chain off chain products be built around that. We're starting to see um, a lot more thought going into 
um, uh, th about what we can put into smart contracts, so and how we scale those uh, appropriately, and and what that interoperability looks like. Um, and I think we're just seeing kind of a professionalization of the space. Um, and I don't mean that the same as I mean institutionalization, because there's a lot of like really like awesome, technically savvy, like DGen people who worked at places like United at big banks, yep. right? Uh, who want to see the space thrive, and so they want it to be credible, but they don't want to get rid of like the core ethos either, right? Um, and so I think what's changed a lot is like you know the early days of Bitcoin, like you know it was a lot of like uh, you know libertarians, and you know it was a very anarchist in some ways. Um, you know as we've gotten to it moving from you know, and crypto has always been been money related, but as we've gotten from moving like to just like some form of, of you know monetary movement to technology that can you know change the world and and increase efficiency, um, we've had the the way of which we talk about it and the type of people yeah. that come into the space change a lot. And to your point, you you mentioned sapiens and we've chatted about the behavioral economics. I think it was extremely underestimated how like human habits uh, are, are not changing that quickly because all of those like anarchists and like the libertarians that were thinking that will replace the entire monetary system with like paying bitcoins and like yeah. buying stuff for bitcoins it like as it turns out nobody wants to do that yeah yeah exactly because yeah. like the habit of uh, like mark to market everything with like a US dollar regardless whether you you are in USA or in like Latam it's still you use US dollar as a benchmark, mm -hmm. not because of the regulation, but just because of the human habit. And it's extremely hard to change such habit. It's really hard. Uh, yeah. And frankly, like the appetite for US dollars and places like Latin America, Southeast Asia, like yeah. it's insatiable, right? Yeah. Uh, which is why stable coins have had done as well as they are um, and why we need like common sense stable coin regulation. Yeah. <laughs> um, we can talk about that another time. But like to your point, like, the, there's like a there's a currency war happening right now uh, between China and the U.S. Yep. And you know China used to be the biggest buyer of U.S. Treasuries. They've since stopped buying U.S. Treasuries. Uh, Japan is now the biggest buyer, and it's clear that and I think it will be harder for you know the, the RMB and, and, and China to proliferate you know their uh, their currency in the same way we have. But it's clear that there is a somewhat of a de-dollarization happening in parts of the world, um, and at the same time. There's a dollarization happening, I think, in places like Latin America, yeah, maybe Africa. Yeah, will <laughs> yeah, exactly. make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, and that's, this is uh, this is my, my picture of why we need stable coins. Yes. So, like, and why the the U.S. should be proliferating stable coins as a way to uh, right. entrench U.S. dollarization. Hundred percent on that with you. Like, I had so many debates with the guys that were saying that. Uh, well, the, the stable coins are, and like the, the crypto is actually against the, the the U.S. monetary system, which I think it's. It's, it's not true. It's no. actually like probably the US government is one of the main beneficiaries of the entire crypto space because most of the crypto is marked to market against US dollar and you have USDT and USDC as the main, uh, like the benchmarks in the entire crypto space. So it's actually a massive de uh, dollarization happening in the entire crypto space. Maybe some people just don't realize that, that they, uh, they, they know the price of the Bitcoin in US dollars. They don't yeah. know the price of the Bitcoin in their local currency. They know what's it that in, in like um, in uh, yen or uh, in rupee or anything else. So that's, I think, a powerful instrument. So if there is a proper regulation in place, the US will probably be the main beneficiary of the entire crypto adoption. 100%. And if there is, uh, if stable coins get big enough in these local markets, so, you know, we have, I think, 160 billion of yep. stable coins outstanding today. Let's say we 5x, 6x from here, right? And you start to see kind of mass usage of US dollar stable coins in places like, for instance, you can pay uh, through your Grab app in Singapore right now yep. with USDC. You're seeing a lot of peer to peer with USDT in Turkey. You're seeing a lot of it in Latin America. If there is, um, you know, we 5, 6x from here and there's like just a, a new, you know, kind of motion for the consumer to pay with these products, the local um, you know, monetary authorities are going to have to adopt. US dollar stable coins as part of the way they think about their monetary authority. Yeah. And that just, you know, that's a, a game changer for, I mean, you know, whether you think that's good or bad, you know, the US government yeah. uh, in terms of, you know, foreign, for their foreign interests. Yeah, it's, once again, it's great we're on the same page here because it's one of the theses of finery markets is we believe not in just the, the trading and speculative nature of crypto, but we believe in the, the proper use cases and the stable coin industry that powers the money remittance 
this is a, one of the most powerful real world use cases in, in the space and that's what helped us kind of uh, keeping us uh, afloat when uh, the crypto winter was happening because we have uh, we have one of our clients as a stable coin issuer in Latin America so that we know that they power uh, their client flows and mining remittance and they do hedge through our venue and like we want to connect most of those different on and off ramps using the stable coin rails so I think this is a Quite a quite a powerful use case that we'll see uh, growing probably like hundred times within the next few years. Let's go back to the VC and Dragonfly in particular. So you guys, um, like you always stated that you have not the spray and pray approach, but mm -hmm. which is quite popular in the in the crypto <laughs> space, especially that was popular like uh, into twenty one and yes. uh, twenty two. Um, so you are quite selective. So can you share a bit more? on the actual way on how do you do the selection process? Is it like top down where you select certain industries and then search the best uh, company within that industry or you're looking for a particular team or a company and then you start exploring the, the industry where they're growing? So I think we tend to be a little bit more bottoms up to be honest. Um, the, you know, there are times when we have, you know, kind of top down like, you know, big theses, right? And stable coins is one of those. We just talked about that a little bit. Um, but the the crypto market's like not that big, right? Like in the amount of you know I, I said there there we did three point one billion dollars worth of of announced deals in, in Q one. So analyze that out. You're talking about like twelve billion for the year, right? The amount of those that I think are like actually call it like top S tier type deals, right? That's probably like five hundred million bucks out of that, right? Like it's 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 a small percentage, a few percentage points, right? Maybe it's a little bit higher, but. Um, you know, let's call it even a billion dollars, right? You know, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, but the, if it's that much and it's a billion dollars, right? And where it's 10% or a little less of the market. Um, and then you go and you look at, uh, you know, what is, you know, uh, all of the funds that have been raised. And you have, you know, Andreessen with their three and a half billion dollar fund and Paradigm with their two and a half billion dollar fund and Han with their one and a half billion dollar fund and Par Pantera with their yep. 1.25 billion dollar fund and my me with my $650 million fund. And you start to realize like, Holy shit, like there is like a lot of capital in this space who are trying to deploy over two, three, four year spans. And like, there's just not enough like good like deals to like digest all of that capital. Um, and so if you're always tops down, like you're like, okay, well I have this thesis on this thing. And then I'm gonna go and spend a lot of time trying to figure out where to put money in it. And sometimes like, you know, that can work and that, you know, I think has worked for us in like stable coins. But um, you have to be able to be responsive to the market where the market's moving to great teams where the, the founders and the entrepreneurs want to build. Um, and, and so we tend to be a lot of that and we tend to be, and we can at times be, be opportunistic. So it's a little bit of both. Um, we encourage everybody at the firm to, to kind of form theses and try to dig into things. But um, I would say most of our really successful deals have actually been a, an, you know, a little bit more Hey, we have great relationships with great entrepreneurs who have great new ideas that expand the market and expand the, the, the TAM. And we dig into how they're thinking about the world and then it clicks for us, right? Um, so a little bit of both, but, but bottoms up uh, primarily. Great, and when you uh, apply this bottoms up approach, uh, so what are those aha moments for you when you talk to the founders, when you talk to the teams? How do you define whether that team is, is great? You know, it's hard to put that into words. Uh, I will say this. I usually know in the first 10 minutes of my like first call whether or not I think this is like gut legs uh, or whether or not it works for us. I think um, Sam Altman has famously said something similar to this, uh, I believe. Um, the A lot of it is, it goes back to my, my, my point earlier around storytelling, right? Yep. Um, you know, the best founders, they have a great idea and then they can pitch it to me and, and or tell the story to me in a way that they know that will resonate with somebody from my, my lens and who obviously knows less about this topic than they yeah. do, right? Uh, or hopefully I do, because if I know more than you, then it's not a good, good thing. <laughs> yeah. um, and so, yeah, you know, you can usually tell pretty quickly, like, do they really know what they're talking about? Are they attacking a really big market? So um, things that I don't like to do or, or things I don't like to back are when people say, hey, listen, like I'm doing, you know, X on chain or I'm doing, you know, 
um, this kind of you know thing, but I'm decentralizing it, or it's a copy paste from one chain to another, right? Yeah. Like these are not people that are thinking big about like you know reinventing financial services, right? Yeah. Uh, what I care about is somebody who's saying I want to think about how do I disrupt an entire industry that is worth you know billions or tens of billions <clears throat> of, of dollars, trillions of dollars, and I'm going to capture all of it. And you have to have some of that insanity, I think, to be like a really really good yeah. good founder. Um, and so usually I can tell pretty quickly like whether or not somebody kind of has that in them. I would say there are times, so, so nine times out of 10, that's it. 10 minutes, I kind of know what's going on, right? Um, and usually it has to be in kind of a really concentrated like call or one-on-one. Like people come up to me all the time at like, conferences like this. And frankly, like I just can't think enough about what they're t telling me when like they yeah, come sure. up to me and kind of, um, and I haven't had time to, to even think about it. But one out of those 10 times, there somebody's explaining to me something that like frankly, like I just don't understand. Um, and then there's a, a piece of data that really jumps out and you're like, oh shit, like this is something that like, uh, I need to pay more attention to. I tend to be really data driven the way I think about investing. Um, you know, the earliest stages you can't be, it's just founder, yep. but you know, I, I tend to gravitate more towards like series A, series B where there's, there's data and, um, being able to show me really interesting data that is not just, oh, TVL growth. Right, but like you know, this is why this, and maybe it matters a lot for your protocol. But if it if it's, but then explain to me why. But like you know, really interesting new piece of data. Like somebody said to me recently, who was um, uh, you know, kind of like a, a, a matcher of lenders and borrowers on chain, and a piece of data they said to me is is uh, sixty percent of our lenders have never lent into DeFi before, right? And that's that like piece of data that you go, oh. Wow. So like they're doing something new that the market is responding to and it never had there and was like wasn't there before. And they're they're reinventing this part of the market. And so something like that, if you can give me that piece of data and your light bulb can just go off. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. How do they track that? <laughs> I'm sure it's self-reported. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, it's uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great perspective. So uh, talking about the, the the market structure and the changes and you mentioned it before that uh, when the industry was just starting or like even five years ago a lot of VCS were funding vertically integrated companies that do everything all together like clearing lending uh, settlement execution like lots of different stuff all together um, and I think the trend is clear after the FTX that the debundling is happening yep um, do you see that as well? Do you see that as a like a good thing for the industry? Do you see that as a like as a mixed thing? Yeah, I mean, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, Debundling absolutely happening to your point, right? Uh, and I think uh, it absolutely has to happen in some cases um, and not in other cases. Um, it's interesting if you think about if you spent any time thinking about like traditional fintech or financial services and like two thousand from two thousand and eight to like two thousand and twenty one. Uh, there was basically like an entire unbundling that happened for the first half of that period and an entire rebundling that yeah. happened at the end of that period. Right. And part of that is because, um, what people realized was that, okay, well, like big banks suck, uh, and like, they don't do anything that well. Uh, they just do a lot of different things. And so we can go and do a, you know, a new thing, uh, or this, this one thing in this vertical, this niche so hyper well that we can attract a bunch of people to it. Yep. We saw it with like, robo advisors, right? And like, you know, Betterment went to $20 billion like really quickly and then basically never went higher. And I think it's still at like $20 billion, yeah. right? At least on the retail side. Um, and then you fast forward to the second half of that period of time and everyone said, holy shit, being a, like that, that's a small business because I can only get those small amount of people who care a lot about like that user experience and this niche thing. And so I need to offer other products, right? Um, or the technology providers realize that like, oh yeah, I get good multiples because I'm a technology provider, but um, I don't have the good economics of being a bank. And so like now I want to be able to lend again and get net interest income. So we saw this, this thing happening. Um, and I see some of that happening in crypto too, right? And that's, there's a long way to get there, but um, we're now we're seeing like everyone be like, okay, well, I'm just going to be settlement. I'm just going to be clearing. Yep. I'm just going to be brokerage. I'm just going to be exchange. I'm just going to be custody. Um, and that happened like really quickly. Um, and then people realize a little bit like that also kind of sucks, right? Like you don't want to have to have like all of these different pieces of market structure. It doesn't really work that well. Um, and so we're seeing a little bit of, you know, what about what I talked about before and TradFi happened over 10 years. This is happening more like two to three years here in crypto because everything moves quicker. Um, but we're, we're seeing some of that, that people start to think, okay, well, like, you know, maybe that's not quite right that we need to pull all these things apart. We don't need to overcorrect to, to FTX. Um, so 
I do think we'll settle at like clearing and settlement should happen or and and, and credit should yep. happen separately than the brokerage and the exchange. It's not clear to me that brokerage and the exchange need to actually be pulled apart uh, in the long run. And basically, uh, the existing brokers are the exchanges and, and vice versa. So That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and what I also think is pretty interesting in what's happening in market structure uh, is post-FTX, a lot more of the flows, and, and this gets to your business, have moved to OTC, right? Because uh, people are very worried about their, who their counterparty is. Um, that's been part of it. So they've also moved towards like tri-party agreements, which I think are, are, are quite important. Um, but my expectation is that we settle somewhere in between what exists in traditional markets and you know somewhere where like FTX was. Um, and I think big beneficiaries of that will be people who can understand who their clients are, what they need, and then uh, meet them somewhere in the middle that doesn't just reinvent the equities yeah. markets or the FX markets. Yeah, well, it's, well, it's our responsibility to do it in a proper way so that yeah. <laughs> we're not end up in, a, in a, quite a mess <laughs> that's now happening with a overly regulated and overly debundled in the TradFi space. Yeah. Um, all right, so you, you, you mentioned brokers and exchanges, by the way, and uh, crypto today is the most fragmented asset class. I guess we talk about that on almost all of our podcast series. Uh, do you need the world needs like a few hundred or even like a few thousand exchanges? No, I mean, definitely not that many. <laughs> um, you know, I, so I, I don't actually know what the right number is. I, maybe, I, maybe I should have done this uh, in like equities markets, right? But there are probably, what, no more than 20 that like have any real volumes. Uh, maybe you have a, a number, but I, I can imagine it's much higher than that. I do think, like right now, everybody trades on, you know, Binance and, and Bybit and, and um, you know, OKX and Coinbase. And there's like in, in Upbit in Korea. So there's a, um, there's a few exchanges that kind of dominate. Yep. Um, my expectation is that that doesn't proliferate for forever, right? I do, right now, part of that has been just that that's where all the liquidity has gone. That's been the easiest way to uh, to get to those, to, to get kind of really good execution and longer tail of assets. Um, but the, with the regulators coming into the space and the local regulators in these different localities and geographies thinking, hey, I need to, you know, really kind of grab hold of this yeah. post FTX. There probably has to be a situation in which we have more geographically focused venues, yep. uh, or you know, more of the market happens in single or multi-dealer like OTC type streaming platforms or things like that, right? And I think we're seeing both of those kind of start to proliferate. So I would expect that over time uh, we do get a little, you know, we go from you know all of these different exchanges or these just, these just few exchanges that we have that, that everyone goes uh, to right now to you know, more than that. But I don't think we go to like, you know, the the hundred in every different nation and, you know, et cetera, that, you know, we, we see pitches for like, you know, uh, the biggest exchange and you know, name your country you yes. know, somewhere. And, you know, in my mind, in almost every one of those cases, Binance just crushed those guys anyways. And when they entered, and so I think there will, will, again, I actually think it probably ends up looking something like the equity market where you have, you know, call it, you know, just a- Primary venues, yeah. Yeah, correct. <clears throat> no, yeah, well, I totally agree. And I think our, our mission and vision here is we want to help all of those smaller exchanges to actually pivot into the brokers yeah. because they call themselves an exchange, but what they're good at is actually working with a local retail clientele. Right. They don't need to operate their matching engine. And that's, I think there was um, like a perception that uh, any new player needs to create their own exchange, but they don't need that. Like they don't need an empty order book that no market maker is willing to support. So that's, I think we'll see more and more players shifting to a brokerage model and yeah our, our vision and our mission is just to help support them with the matching engine that they can source from the electronic market makers otc so i think that's uh, th that's going to be the transition we'll we'll happy to chat in like the next three five years and see how we kind of yeah. succeeded with that but yeah i mean you talk to the market makers more than i do probably but i'm I, i'm starting to hear them have like fatigue Yep. Right. And they're like, why do I need to do this 15th integration into the same thing in this like, you know, different place? It doesn't make a lot of sense. Right. And so, um, you know, it, it's starting to become apparent to everybody. There's just like too many venues. Yep. Right. Um, and so we, you know, there's there's only a few venues with liquidity and we clearly need better liquidity on more venues than just those few, uh, to your point. But we also don't need, you know, somebody to start the 30th exchange or 40th exchange in the U.S. Right. And we're seeing a lot of those. Yeah, yeah. 
Great. And <clears throat> that's exactly. So if we, uh, if some of our listeners are like the local exchanges or the local brokers, guys, please come to us. We'll just help you <laughs> get the part of our uh, like el electronic matching engine, and then you can take care of all of the client business and the and the client facing side of business. Um, so let's let's get back to the um, market structure. Uh, we've talked a bit about the on-chain and off-chain developments, and like with the debundling, I think it's actually a great timing in the market right now to make within the debundling relocate some of the services on chain but still maintain some of that off chain so how do you see this uh, on versus off chain world uh, of, of debundling happening what services should be on chain and what's more efficient off chain so matching engines are obviously uh, better off chain right now and I think it's clear that that's likely to be true for the foreseeable future. You know, there's some really cool, interesting technology that's being built around things like parallel execution. And that is going to, you know, theoretically bring, you know, better types of trading on chain. That said, like you talk to anybody and you talk, you know, latency is unlikely to ever be there in the way it is in the institutional market and in and, and traditional asset classes. Um, so. I think it's a little bit more uh, around, okay, so what do you want to do off-chain versus what do you want to do on-chain? It's clear that there is value add to having an immutable, trustless ledger, right? And so doing settlement on-chain, being able to have proof of reserves on-chain, being able to have transparency into solvency and um, you know positioning on-chain, and maybe not in a way that gives away whether you're long or short or exactly what yeah. types of assets you're into, but maybe using CK proofs to... Um, uh, you know, kind of abstract some of that away and just prove that you are solvent or that you are, you know, delta neutral maybe if that's, the, the, you know, something that you're trying to do, et cetera. Um, and so there's clear, you know, ability, I think, to prove things on chain, to settle on chain, to have a streaming data on chain that is better than what exists in our opaque sy systems. But the matching engine uh, is something that I think we're a long way away. I also think being hybrid self-custody, tri-party custody will be good. I think having the custody at the exchanges themselves, that will uh, continue to go away, especially for like the large institutional actors. There has to be, tri-party agreements we're starting to, to see get stood up by almost all the major exchanges, depending on what broker they're going through. Um, you know, and then if they're not, you know, facing off directly, which you know, mostly is just the HFT guys. I think a lot of the non-HFTs are going away from that. And so, that is, you know, custody being able to be off chain and in, in some sort of tri-party, or being able to, you know, self custody but in a more institutional quality, kind of signing, you know, MPC type wallet or, or something else. That's really still really tough, and the the, the technology is not quite there. But there's a lot of reasons for that those things to exist on chain, and I think that's where the market's moving. But things like, you know, like. Uh, you know, doing the execution and, and, yeah. and matching. Like my guess is that is off chain for, for a long period of time, if not forever. Yeah, we, we also, I think, fully agree on that. And the, the entire concept of blockchain, I think is, and the smart contract is helping reduce the counterparty risk. So on the yeah. post trade settlement side, this is extremely important. And uh, we're like excited to work with some of the partners in the space that are developing the products that will help mitigate the counterparty risk and the uh, like the on-chain nature of things yeah. whether it's like an atomic swap or um, some bottle lending or like the money market capabilities which are also important to uh, to streamline the post-trade settlement process but yeah. i think there's way more to do in the space so uh, yeah it would be great great to uh, explore more projects in that area yeah, i mean the capital efficiency of doing post-trade settlement on chain is just dramatically better yeah. Right. And being able to do collateral uh, on chain that's tokenized that you don't need to do like end of day settlement. Like it's so obvious to me that like that is going to happen and yeah. going to exist because it's just it's better for everybody. There's like no reason for it not to exist. We just have to get the right tooling in place. Exactly. And I remember when I was just starting my career in the electronic trading space was 15 years ago. And uh, we were building and uh, like the DMA infrastructure uh, through a bunch of uh, US uh, brokers. And I was quite surprised to, to learn that probably 70 to 80% of the cost of the trading was actually not on the trading side, but on the post trading side. Mm. But all of those large custodians and like the, the, the entire chain that operated those legacy systems with like an extremely, uh, extremely expensive and inefficient post trade settlement, 
Um, th this, I think, definitely needs to be eliminated and needs to be way more optimized. And that's what uh, right now I see is happening in the crypto space, like step by step. Yeah. But there's a huge uh, potential there. Yeah, absolutely. And when you have less costs, you have more trading volume, which is also great for, <laughs> for, for, for right. us and for our industry. Um, what are the main focus uh, areas for you guys and like for, 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 for the entire space? Is it like RWAs? Like, do you still see any focus in the L2s? What's driving the, the focus for the next few years for you guys? Yeah, for us specifically, I think we're, we're, we're really focused. Like I said earlier, I'm like very data driven. Um, and so I sometimes struggle with these, you know, types of like new verticals where people are like, okay, just dream about this future world that like, you know, has never existed before and doesn't exist now. And it's not clear to me how we get from A to Z. And I think a lot of what happens with entrepreneurs is they, uh, they really want Z to happen, but they don't realize that there's like a lot of steps between A and Z and that there's like things that they need to do. And they don't really necessarily understand who their customers are. And so uh, my, my honest opinion is like, that's uh, like you, you mentioned RWA, like almost all of the RWA entrepreneurs, that's the world they live in today, where it's like they want Z to happen and Z probably will happen. But like, we're so far away from anybody trading a, you know, tokenized, you know, name your asset and in any real way yeah. uh, on that chain, right? And there's not really like demand for most of those products. And I think there's, there's reasons for certain types of venues on chain, you know, tracking, et cetera, to exist. But uh, it's very, we're very, very far away from anyone being like, you know, uh, you know, trading a fund interest on chain in any real way, right? Um, so, uh, but to more about what we are actually are focused on, what does that mean? Like, I'm, I'm focused on things that, like, I feel very strongly are working and will continue to work. So things like stable coins, things like, um, you know, market structure and CFI that is, I think, making the entire system better. Um, DeFi still continues to be a, a, a big focus. Um, Interoperability, scalability solutions, those continue to be a, a, a really big focus for us because they're not there yet, right? Things like tools that allow us to do chain abstraction, right? Or in, intents uh, on chain that allow us to execute different types of orders, right? Those are places where it's clear to me that these are improvements on a system that works already. So we focus a lot on those things. Some of the more speculative verticals we, we, we pay attention to, we think about things like AI and crypto. We haven't done a lot there. I think most of it doesn't make any sense and we're seeing a lot of weird things that will never work get funded. But you know, maybe decentralized compute uh, marketplaces, like those will work, right? And so we did, a, we did a bet there and we believe in that. Or things like on the D-pin side, right? And, and you can, you can uh, argue what I just said was actually D-pin, not, not AI. But uh, there's a lot of things it, to my earlier point about tokenization or RWAs, where people don't understand who their customer are, or like they're yeah. going to bootstrap supply of something and some data or whatever, but they like don't really figure they know who they're going to sell to, yeah. like why there's anyone they're going to sell to, right? And so we're paying attention. Like we, you know, our job as VCs is to you know see around you know curves, but uh, we we need to see some understanding from the entrepreneurs and the market that there's like also demand for these things and. Uh, at this point, for a lot of the hot things in crypto, we, we haven't seen that. So, yeah, well, <laughs> we'll monitor and see see that. And uh, I wanted to like ask properly the, the, the last question about um, the funding mechanics. So during the last bull cycle, most of the deals were happening with uh, like tokens uh, versus equity or like token plus equity. Yeah. Do you guys do, um, did you, do a lot of the deals like that? Do you still do like token plus equity? So the market standard right now is, you know, either, either a safe or a priced yep. equity round with like a token warrant or token side letter. That's pretty much the market standard. There's a number of reasons for that, you know, both legally and regulatory uh, related. Uh, you know, we, so it's been a long time since I've seen like a SEFT, yeah. uh, right? And those for the most part don't really exist today. They, and we would, I would advise people not to do SAFs, right? Um, and the same way, uh, we do do equity only deals, right? About 35% about of the portfolio actually doesn't have a token component uh, because we you know, invest across all the different types of, of the, the market. Uh, in those deals, all we really care about is, or in ones where there's equity and actually it's, it's more important than ones where there's equity and tokens. What we really care about is the entrepreneur and the founding team uh, knows like where the value should accrue and drives towards that versus if you try to like split the two, like it becomes like really, really tough. And so if you want to decentralize, you want to have, you know, token value, you just know from day one that that's what I'm driving towards. 
or if you're if you're saying I'm going to have a token for some sort of bootstrap supply, but like all of the all of the the value is going to going to accrue to the equity, and that's fine. But you should be just transparent about that, and also with the market when you know, that token comes uh, comes to market. And I think we've seen some of the D, the D pin deals. Uh, that is actually what's happening, yep. but like they've uh, been not transparent about that with the market, and part of the, and you've seen some bad price action and people upset about it. And so that transparency, I think, is what's really important. So, yeah, yeah, I think like th there's a lot of supply right now, like that that is is almost uh, like end of uh, the lockup period, or will soon be released of the lockup periods for most of the deals that happened like in 21, 22. And I think the public is slowly slowing, uh, like slowly starting to realize that, um, more, like for certain deals, uh, for certain VCs, it was used just as an exit liquidity. And uh, do you think that we will see? more like tokens going <laughs> way, way down due to this massive uh, supply gap? Listen, I think in, in crypto, there's been that, so to your, your point, you're like kind of alluding to the conversation uh, that's been happening on Twitter and other places around like, you know, high FDV, yeah. like low yeah, flow yeah. types of things, right? And I think um, some of the argument is a red herring, right? Because, you know, when you do an IPO, like typically like, you know, 10 to 20 percent is something that is is usually kind of floated originally. Um, then there's some sort of form of unlock, you know, but most of those unlocks are maybe just six months, right? And then yep. everything's unlocked. I, I think, so I think a lot of the like VCs are bad guys, like conversation, like just kind of like doesn't take into account um, right. what, how, you know, markets exist otherwise. Uh, what I do believe though, is I do believe that like there is finite capital in crypto right now. And so you just have to have people want to, you know, bet on, you know, certain things. You have to have people want to invest in certain things. And we do have a lot of kind of, you know, unlocks happening to your point. If you look at a lot of the, the charts from 21, like you basically saw like straight up and then straight down and then they've kind of gone sideways, right? That market structure, you know, isn't good for morale, right? And it isn't good for uh, encouraging the right participants. So one of the parts of the conversation that's been happening today is, well, we have all this VC capital, but we don't really have like really sophisticated liquid capital yep. uh, in the markets today. We have some of it, but not near the amount and those numbers I was talking about earlier and uh, not, not near the sizes. And because of that, you have this kind of weird dichotomy where there's like this like big bid for things like in the private markets and then there's not necessarily them in the public markets. But we saw that in like Web two as well, right? And so those aren't those aren't necessarily disconnected, and it's because people saw this arb where if you did things in private markets, and because you know technology was just kind of growing more broadly, you're getting beta, and you're likely yeah. to make money, right? I think my and and I, I know uh, even internally at Dragonfly we don't agree on this topic. My perspective is we probably need to be a little bit more thoughtful around things around you know, what the unlock schedules look like uh, and how we structure that. Uh, probably doing things like, um, also like, you know, for, for the teams, instead of giving teams like, you know, X amount from day one, they get, you know, regular refreshes, kind of like you do an equity, like there's, uh, you know, there's earned tokens and earnouts and things like that for the teams themselves. Uh, for the VCs, there's probably, you know, different types of lockups uh, depending on, um, you know, like maybe we just do, uh, you know, a cliff, right? And then everybody unlocks on day one. I think that probably makes a little bit more sense than this like slow trickle of dilution. There's, and I also think like, honestly, like variable token supply instead of fixed token supply would improve the market. I know I'm, I'm probably gonna get like shot for <laughs> saying that, but they, like, you know, and you do, and you and you, 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 gov you do governance around that uh, so that, you know, you can't just like, you know, dilute all the token holders and, you know, kind of rug them. And you have to be thoughtful around how that, that, that conversation works. This is, you know, what I'm talking about is kind of a wholesale, like upheaval of, yeah. of the way we do things. And so it's probably not happening anytime soon, but it makes a lot more sense to me that we don't just say, Hey, listen, like, so everybody knows, like you're going to get diluted by 90% uh, over, uh, you know, the next like three years instead say like, listen to the amount of supply. These are the type the way we think about plans at the foundation. And these are the types of programs we have in place and then people can do their own math and it allows sophisticated liquid investors to come in and potentially have alpha. And with that, the markets will behave in a way that will become more efficient for everybody. Well, let's hope, <laughs> let's hope for that. I'm and, not hopeful, but you know, yeah. uh, 
we'll see. Uh, yes, exactly. So I think it was a great, great, uh, thoughtful discussion. Uh, really enjoyed it. I think uh, most of our listeners did read Sapiens, but uh, we'll definitely post a link for that horror. <laughs> uh, House of Leaves. House of Leaves, yes. Yeah. Uh, we'll, yeah, we'll post a link about that. And uh, thanks, uh, thanks for being with us today. Please yeah. follow us on the Spotify, YouTube, and um, all the other podcast channels. Thanks for having me on. It was great. Thank you, Rob. Cheers.